we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is David Day. Um, I am one of the programming mentors for Team 1816, the Green Machine. Um, and uh, today doing the presenting will be Ian McMahon. He is our lead vision programmer. Hello, yeah. Um, we're gonna just be talking about uh, our custom vision processing, a little intro. Um, we're gonna be covering some really basic stuff here, um, but also gonna give some code examples and stuff for getting you guys off the right foot for vision processing. And one of the questions that I think a lot of you may have is why do you see us not saying anything about limelight? Um, so hopefully as we go through our vision, you'll the, the presentation, you'll understand why we're not using limelight and uh, by the end of that, you'll, you'll know why. All right, so the mission of FIRST 1816 um, is to create bold, confident leaders who transform culture to promote value and celebrate STEM. And we try to bring this to everything we do. Um, and to promote FIRST to new audiences, we have to do this. And also to be our vision, to meet our vision, to be a role model for racial professionalism. Um, we try to do presentations like this to expand FIRST to make FIRST available for all. Um, we follow our core values in everything we do, um, and just wanted to start off with this. All right, next slide. Okay, so today we're going to talk about how to create your own team's vision, custom vision solution. Um, we're going to talk about computer vision and its benefits. We're going to talk about the hardware requirements for vision processing. We're going to talk about general detection strategies that your team can use, um, as well as where to go um, from there. We're going to talk, show some real life code examples and do a quick demo. Um, and we're also going to talk about potential next steps and answer any questions you might have. Yeah, feel, feel free anytime during this presentation to put some messages into chat and uh, or even open the mic and ask a question uh, as we go if you have questions on anything. So just to start us off, like what is computer vision? Um, computer vision, simply put, is using a camera to detect real life targets on the field um, in FRC especially. Um, we're basically taking objects that we see in the field that humans can see and detect, and we're going to extract data from those targets, such as position, distance, um, and orientation. And then from that, we can utilize that data to, say, shoot a ball into a target or move towards a certain point. So quick video here, um, hopefully it goes through. This is a really good example of why we use computer vision. This was our uh, six ball auto at, um, at Lake Superior Regional. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, I think so. All yeah. right. So that kind of comes back to why we use computer vision. Um, first of all, it's really fast. Uh, computers can process data much faster than drivers um, in an average of milliseconds. Um, versus drivers who have to manual align and use what they can to shoot targets, especially this year, to targets that are on the other side of the field, more than 30 feet away. Um, vision is really accurate. Um, it allows for complex calculations to be made in milliseconds, um, and it increases target accuracy. Uh, like I said, for this game, especially, if you don't have vision, you're not going to be really successful. And I think every top 10 team uses vision that I saw in first up, uh, updates now. So that's something. After that, um, it wins. So teams that utilize vision are able to consistently integrate it into autonomous actions and increase initial points. I know this year we had a large success. We averaged an additional 18 points right at the start of the match in the first 15 seconds because of vision and our autonomous system. Um, and that kind of success and accuracy um, can really high, like highlight your gameplay. Uh, so in this presentation, we're going to cover retroreflect detection. Uh, this is basically detection. We're detecting the vision tape on the field that first provides. Um, this isn't the most accurate solution. There are other methods that we can use, to, especially with this targeting tape, to be more accurate. But it is the easiest to get started, and it'll give you a really good place for your team to start. Um, so what, we, what do we do? Uh, we start by shining a really bright light at retroreflective tape in the field. Um, and then from there, an image is taken by a camera and the bright light is separated from the rest of the photo, generally doing a color, using a color range. So we'll say, I want all these colors that are between uh, green and blue, right? 
Now, since we're shining a really bright light at the retroreflective tape, this is much brighter than the rest of the field. Um, and so what that allows us to do is it allows us to separate that a lot easier. Then once we do that, the math is done to determine if the target is actually a target because you'll get some false positives. First fields have really inconsistent lighting and there's a lot of changing factors between events, especially with aluminum and metal um, can reflect it really easily. And then once we've done that, we, once we check for parts of the target using size, angle, and other things like that, uh, we'll send the cords of the target to uh, network tables, which you've probably used um, on your robot. And that'll let us control the rest of the robot using that data. Well, you know, I was talking about using the retroflective light and the calibration. Uh, that's why it's really important uh, at the events to go out to the field during the calibration period to tune your whole system for those lighting conditions at that event. All right, so what does the system need? Um, so for most teams, uh, this is really all you need. You only need really four things. Uh, first is a camera. Um, you can go really high end with this or you can go really cheap. Um, we had a little bit of confusion um, with getting cameras our first time. Um, Basically, we ordered a few from Amazon, and even though they were the same product, they had different settings. So we weren't able to correctly control our cameras in code um, to limit exposure. So a camera, uh, this will probably run you 30 to $60 for a low-end one, or maybe even cheaper. And for a higher-end one, it can be up, up to what our team uses, maybe at 300 350 So, But to start, I would definitely go for a lower-end model. Um, the coprocessor, uh, it's a computer that runs on the robot. Uh, this basically processes all the frames um, from the camera. It does all your processing. You're not using the RoboRio for this. Um, this the RoboRio is very limited. Um, it's a great thing for running the robot, but once you start passing in tons of frames, as many as you can, um, it gets really slow. So we use another processor like a Raspberry Pi or something else like that. Then we also use a green light. Um, there's a lot of options for this. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you might have seen limelights in the field using green light. There's a reason for that. Um, and yeah, and we also need a heat sink. Uh, both the coprocessor and the green light can get really hot. So heat sinks are definitely must have if you're building a custom system. Yeah, and uh, one comment too on, um, no, I lost my thought, sorry. <laughs> oh, I remember the camera. There's a comment about the camera that Ian made that, um, we ordered the, I mean, it was the exact same part number from the manufacturer, um, but the two different lots, it was more than just different settings. They had different connectors on them. So they were physically different parts that ended up being wired differently. And that caused a big problem for, for spares for us. So better to go get something from a known source, a vendor like DigiKey or something like that, that you really know that you're going to get the same thing. We may have been getting calls at an event that I wasn't at. Like the cameras are turning gray, um, so yeah, that was that was fun. Um, cameras, anyway, cameras are really important for any sort of vision processing system because without a camera, you don't have vision. There's no there's no input. Um, so a few tips for our that we found picking cameras is that you really want to opt for a high frame per second over resolution. You might not know this, but certain cameras can actually record at different frames per seconds for different resolutions. So for example, um, this camera down here might be able to record at 60 FPS at a really low resolution, say 620 by 340, right? Or 640 by 320. And then, but at HD, it'll record at 30 FPS or 15 FPS. And so when you're trying to maximize the, the performance of your uh, vision processing system and increase your frames per second, you're really going to want to. You're going to be using the lowest resolution anyway, because you want it. You want it more frames over resolution. So definitely check the specs and whatever camera you're going to use, because that's really important. Also, uh, a lot of teams use different cameras. Uh, there's no camera really is perfect. Um, there's obviously down here we have a Raspberry Pi camera, but we have uh, an ELP camera, and then we have a, um, a like a Microsoft what live cam. Life cam. And I've seen these in every single robot. Like there's there's tons of different variations. I've seen teams use all of these. Um, find one that works and get multiple because like anything else in vision, things are gonna break. Um, these are fragile components that you're putting on 125 pound robots. And we uh, likelihood is that something's gonna go wrong and you're gonna need another one. 
And one thing to mention too is that a lot, I mean, a lot of teams will have a separate camera for the driver uh, that's independent of vision. And because um, mainly you may want to have it in a different location uh, for them to use. But one thing to keep in mind too of uh, if you are going to use cameras for the driver station is the bandwidth is important. I mean, just like for us, vision processing, the, you know, the frame rate versus a high resolution uh, is more important for vision processing. It's also true for drivers. Um, they'd rather know where the robot is. Um, I, I've seen teams trying to push very high bandwidth to the driver station, and it starts, uh, it starts dropping frames. Um, FRC actually limits all the communication to a, a certain frame rate. That's not really a frame rate, a bit of bandwidth. And uh, they prioritize the robot traffic. So if you start pushing too much data across that pipe, they'll just drop, start dropping frames on you. Um, so it's better just to go to lower resolutions. And that kind of takes us on to our coprocessor. Um, this is basically just a word for in our computer. Um, generally, these are Linux-based um, mini computers that um, can run on pretty low power. Um, but for these, the faster it is, the better. Um, obviously, that's going to run up costs. And so for a starting rig, um, you, there's few things to keep in mind. One, different coprocessors are better at different things. Um, for example, the Jetson, which is one we use, um, is capable of machine learning, which the Raspberry Pi, for example, is not. But the actual Jetson has the, a worse CPU than the Raspberry Pi 4 and an equivalent CPU to the Raspberry Pi 3. And while the Jetson costs hundred dollars the Raspberry Pi 3 costs thirty dollars so there's a there's a little bit of a trade-off here because different things specialize in different functions um, I will say that most teams go with the Raspberry Pi if you're going starting off um, it's easy it's convenient um, and it's really low cost so you can buy multiple of them especially this year now that they've added uh, multiple like variations of RAM um, it makes it a little bit easier for teams to make the decision but if you're looking at processing later on, uh, the Jetson's now even more affordable um, because it has a two gigabyte model for 60 bucks uh, besides the normal model. So th these are a few options that we looked into. There's also more advanced options for machine learning, but realistically at this point in time, it's not as, it's not as reasonable now that the Jetson Nano is out. Yeah, and uh, one of the main reasons why we're using the Jetson and, and why we're not using something like the Limelight, um, I think we have to stop. At, at the end, I think I'll show uh, what we actually use. But one of the cameras that we're using, we're using something called the Z Mini camera. And uh, the Z Mini camera is a stereoscopic camera. Um, and why is that important? I mean, it's, it's why we have two eyes, it gives us depth perception. Um, so one of the things that we did this year in our robot is we actually got distance to the target from this camera. Um, in order to do that, you have to have two cameras. Um, they have to be synchronized together. So they have the exact same frame and that's something that the Z gives you. Um, in order to use their processing, they require to have, uh, an NVIDIA processor which is why we were using the Jetsons. Um, and this camera can actually measure distance out to about 50 feet. Um, its accuracy does get worse and it has to do with the pixel size of what images and frames you're doing, so there's a balance. Um, so for instance, this year, when we were out at the, um, the color wheel, um, we were, that means around 30 feet and the, system was probably off at about, I think it was off about three feet at that distance. Um, but once we got closer to the target, um, like going into the feeder stations, um, this thing was literally within like a quarter of an inch of the actual distance. So you can use that during all your robot programming to figure out how far you are to, we were using to change the, the ball uh, shooter speed so we could actually get different speeds at different distances so we could hit the target. And that really assisted with autos as well, especially when the driver can't, when there's not a, when there's, it's, it's you're really within the range and you're also going really fast. Um, 
LEDs. Uh, LEDs are an annoying but necessary part of uh, retroreflection detection, mainly because it blinds people. Um, these LEDs are really bright, and the really general rule is you want as high power as possible, um, but you also want to make sure it's safe. So I don't remember. There's, there's, a, I think there's a rule in FRC uh, about LEDs. Maybe Mr. Day can talk about that once I'm done. But um, the there's a balance to be made here. Um, Limelight's really bright. Um, definitely, in my opinion, maybe a little too bright. But these LEDs are. You want it to be as high power as possible to make the most difference between the things that aren't having the LED shine on them, so the retro, then other retroreflect tape, and the retroreflective tape. So basically, but what other problem with high power is that it also means higher heat. So LEDs can burn out and change color over time. That will mess with your vision system, and it will force you to either recalibrate or replace your LED. We've had this happen maybe three or four times now. Um, and before we added an aluminum block at the back of the LED, and that's kind of ties in the heat sink idea. Um, and it just fixed, it created it so we had to replace it a lot less. LEDs, I would buy a lot of them. Um, they're relatively cheap, um, but you do have to wire them out specifically. Uh, they need to have constant current to not burn out or break or explode. Um, so use things like a buck puck or something like that that you can buy easily on Amazon to um, maintain that constant current. We use Super Bright LEDs, it's a brand. Um, they make a bunch of LEDs, um, but there's a bunch of different places to buy LEDs and no LED is perfect. Um, really, LEDs are like the least specific thing you have to spend time on. Um, honestly, I just find something that works and go with that. And, and, and the reason why you wanna use like the buck puck and the constant current, if, if you think about any dimmable um, lights that you have in the home that you run off of AC. Um, you know, prior to the advent of LED bulbs, uh, everything was using voltage to change the brightness of your lamps for the dimmers. And uh, LEDs don't work that way. Um, you change the voltage um, and, and they don't necessarily change their light controllably. Um, and uh, having, they all work off of a constant current to control their brightness. So with your robot, especially being out on the field, everything is going through I and mean, I think mostly everyone has seen their driver station logs and what the voltages do um, you've got constantly varying brightness that will really impact the quality of your detection um, and uh, Ian also mentioned about the, um, the FRC rules that that was like new for this last year they require you to have the lights turn off um, if, when you're not doing vision detection um, so, so that way it doesn't blind other drivers and things like that. Uh, the side benefit of that too, by the way, is that you can actually tell a lot of times as people are programming their robot and trying to do things with vision, um, the driver may not want to use vision uh, very frequently. So uh, you can tell when the driver turns vision on and is using it. So you can pay attention to make sure things are working the way that you expect. Now, just because we don't have a dedicated slide on driver trust, um, vision and driver trust go hand in hand. If your driver doesn't trust your process, he's not going to use it. And what's going to end up happening is the driver, you're going to be like, why didn't you use it? And then either you're going to do better and the vision system should probably be improved or you're going to do worse and everyone's going to be unhappy. So really establishing driver trust in the system is a really crucial aspect of vision that doesn't get talked about a lot. But the operator and the driver should both, be, and the coach should be really confident in vision to the point where they will not shoot the robot if you do not have vision on. Especially this year when you're making shots from um, from far back, um, it should be to the point where there is no question on whether you should use vision, um, and you want to make your system up to that point. Heat sinks are interesting. Um, basically, anytime heat cal heat anytime calculations are done with machines, uh, heat needs to be managed. And so this also applies to LEDs, like I was talking about, them burning out is a serious problem. Um, so you wanna manage that. You can literally just cut an aluminum block. I don't know if many of you have CNC mills or routers, um, but even just like a saw, like cut, take a piece of aluminum, cut it, and then just put an LED on it, and that'll serve just fine. Um, they also do sell like, um, for Raspberry Pines especially, they sell these like mini heat sinks um, that are also helpful. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options. Really just hunk of metal works fine as well. Yeah, make sure you do read whatever board you use, look at what their recommendations are um, on the Jetson that we ended up using. Um, they say you don't necessarily need to have a heat sink or like a fan on their heat sink. It does come with one, but we actually found with all the processing that we we're doing that it was getting over, it was overheating. Um, and it's both true of the Raspberry Pi and the other one, they'll go to a thermal limiting mode. Um, so you'll, you'll be sitting there and you, you got your code working great for vision detection. Uh, but once the thing starts driving through the competition, all of a sudden you discover that it stops working. Uh, and one of the things you should check to see if your processors went into a thermal override and they just will slow down their calculations and, and not work as well. All right. So now we're going to move from hardware into software. Um, software, there's a few options. Um, Generally, you're going to be working with the library OpenCV, um, especially to start with. Um, from there, you have two options. You have Python and you have C++. I really don't like coding in C++. I'm not very good at it. So everything here is going to be in Python. Um, C++ is an option if your team has prior knowledge, but it's also, in my opinion, a steeper learning curve. Um, and we had a lot of difficulties getting it working on Raspberry Pi, even when we had someone um, who was working that all year. Uh, so fair warning, uh, I found the Python ones easier. Um, they were easier to prototype because Python comes pre-installed on uh, almost every Linux device. So there's there's a little bit of a this or that there, but work with what works for you. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the benefit of C++ is that it is faster than the Python. Um, so if you're doing some really intense stuff, you are going to get better performance out of that, but we found that Python is pretty effective and there's different libraries that will integrate and help accelerate some of these uh, different um, languages. So like Python, there's some, there's some modules that are compiled for that that are like met for the Jetson. So they'll use their coprocessor. Um, and that, that the Jetson has actually got NVIDIA CUDA cores on it to do a lot of its stuff. So. Another reason why I went with that board is there's other libraries because other people are doing this. All right, so um, for those of you who are programmers among us, um, this is gonna look familiar. Um, a lot of these things are gonna be things you already know about. Uh, for people who aren't, here you go. Um, so anytime you're writing software, you're gonna use something called an IDE. Um, this is an integrated development environment or editor. I, it works, right? Um, you're basically going to be using, it's like a notepad. Uh, this is where you write your code. So for IDE, generally teams use VS Code or IntelliJ. Uh, for Python, we use PyCharm. Um, but note that you can write it in VS Code. You can write it even in IntelliJ if you wanted to. Um, so Python's pretty flexible. Uh, libraries, OpenCV, um, that's what we use. There's some other libraries. If you want to get into neural networks, there's TensorFlow or PyTorch or things like that. Um, and we also have some assistance libraries for streaming or for network tables. Um, I already talked about Python versus C++. C++ is faster, more difficult. Python's easier, slower. That's, that's, that's the gist. Uh, OS, uh, Linux is very nice for developing um, Python. Now, first hates Linux um, for some reason. Uh, not a lot of software runs in Linux on first. Um, so what I did was I dual booted my computer um, it, it works. Um, but again, if you're not doing anything with like neural networking or going down, really down the rabbit hole in this, Windows will work fine, Mac OS will work fine, Linux will work great. Uh, Python 2 or 3, uh, go with 3. Uh, Python 3, 2 is like the older version. It's also not updated anymore. So I don't know why you'd use Python 2, but people still use it. So um, there's that. You might find code that's in Python 2. Um, it's generally pretty easy to convert. The really major thing that changed was print lines, um, where it said you have parentheses now. So if you can want to convert something, contact us and we'll help you. Uh, go with Python 3, though. It's pretty chill. Um, Python libraries, we use Pi network tables. Uh, this is basically a network tables wrapper because um, we need to communicate with the robot somehow. OpenCV Python is this pre-compiled OpenCV for Python. Note here that if you're doing anything again with neural networking, you'll need to build it from source. 
But to start with, this is all you need. Um, streamer, we use this Flask OpenCV Streamer package. Um, basically, this allows us to stream our camera to our driver station. Um, and this can be really helpful for calibration and purposes like that. So yeah, that's the software we use. So there's a question about using Java. Um, so that is a viable option. Um, it's just something else you have to install on your device and manage. Um, Performance-wise, I think it's going to be slower than Python. Uh, most of the OpenCV, if you go out there and look at tutorials and what people are doing, uh, you're going to find a lot more examples and libraries for um, Python than you are in other than in Java. Yeah, the reason I only put Python C++, Open, uh, OpenCV also has wrappers in Go, has wrappers in uh, Java, like you said. <laughs> One of the things we use is the ZSDK. The ZSDK only works with Python and C++, but also everything AI, if you're going to move towards that route, is done in Python or C++, generally Python. And like Mr. Day said, the the there's a lot more resources for Python C++ than there is for Java. But I mean, hey, it works if you're doing something like that, totally go for it. So why is, someone asked, why is Java slower? OpenCV, uh, okay, so OpenCV is originally written in C++. C++ is then converted to Python using a package called Cython, right? Or Cython. I don't know how you pronounce it, right? But that's converted, so it's basically converted from native C++ into, or C, into Python. That makes it slower than C++, but I personally can't speak to the, how the Java is converted. Um, but I actually have done some testing with Java and it is slower. It also doesn't have as much package support, like we're saying. Um, so if you're quite Py the Python open CV wrapper is not that hard to learn. Um, you don't really need to know Python that well to use it. I, they have some, the docs are kind of rough initially, but, um, there's a lot of good resources and like stack overflow and stuff for getting started with that. It's, it's basically, I mean, Java has to have a native interface to talk call into the C++ libraries. And it's that interface mechanism in Java that is much slower. Um, it just has to go through more layers to make the calls. And when we're sitting here talking about processing video frames, um, anything that's gonna slow that down uh, is gonna be a problem. So it, the Python, when you see we've got example code coming up, um, it's actually not that difficult to pick up and learn the syntax of Python. Um, and there's really not many lines of code to it. Perfect segue into this. Yeah, so this is uh, coding, co example code. Um, basically, this is, if you don't know anything about Python, um, this will probably help you out with that. Um, so in these, I don't know, if I remove the comments, it would be six lines. In these six lines of code, um, we've taken an image and we've shown it. Um, we've actually started a capture and are reading the frame every image. So first we import OpenCV, um, and then we start a capture. Uh, and then, well, okay, everyone in Java is going to hate this. You never write infinite loops in Java. Uh, Python and vision processing, you have to process the image every frame. And realistically, your program stops either when you get a flag maybe from network tables that you want to be fancy, or if your robot just shuts off. So there's not a ton of reason not to just throw your code into a into an infinite loop, at least initially, um, because it, it it's a little hacky, but realistically, there's not a ton of issues with it because you're just doing the same thing to every image, every frame. And then we show the image. Um, at, and you can see the window name is camera stream. Uh, pretty straightforward. And then we do a wait key. Wait key basically is going to say it's the equivalent of a sleep. Um, but it actually, it's a little confusing. This is going to wait for a one millisecond. If you put a zero here, it would just show a still frame. Um, so wait key is one of the things, if you forget it, your code's not going to run. Um, but you can also delay it by increasing this. Just a, a quick little uh, question for everyone who's on here too is, uh, so how many of you are actually programmers on your teams and are you, anyone familiar with Python? It's gonna a feel for how many people, this is gonna be completely new. You just put it in the chat. Oh, 
one person saying they're familiar with Python. And that, I mean, the one thing too, if you are doing like even Limelight, they, they support some custom open CV in, in their code also, just without the stereoscopic. Okay, so it looks like we've got some people familiar with Pythons and look like we got maybe just off of the small sampling in table 50-50. All right, sweet. Um, note that the, there are indentations in Python, but they don't really copy over to Google Slides that well. So um, at the end of this, we can show you a quick demo of something that will be a little easier to see. Um, this is the second step of what I talked about. This is where we're separating the, the good from the bad via color. Um, so we import the package again. We're also going to use NumPy this time because um, we want to basically make color ranges. Um, NumPy is basically a way to make arrays in Python and a lot of other stuff that is not what we need for this. But if you want to do a lot of scientific complex math, NumPy is your friend. Um, you're basically going to, this time, instead of actually taking a webcam, we're going to read from a file. So the syntax you'll see is completely similar. It's just cv2.imread. We're going to put in a file name. Um, and there you go. We have an image. Now we're going to make a range. This is an HSV. Um, so if you don't know what HSV, it stands for hue, saturation, value, or variance. People say it differently. Um, basically, it's a different color space. Um, I probably should have thrown in an image of what that looks like just in a graphic representation here. Um, this is kind of what we use for um, all sorts of detection. Um, and in OpenCV, it's a little weird because the values go from 0 to 180 and then 0, 0255, 0, 0255 instead of just 0, 0255. That, that's going to sound really confusing. Um, basically, it's just another variation of RGB, right? Uh, different color scheme. Now we're going to convert the color from uh, BGR is what OpenCV calls RGB. I don't know why they do that. It's kind of confusing, but we're going to convert it to HSV. Um, and then we're going to use an in-range function uh, or method to basically convert it. Um, and really, that one line takes us from this this uh, top image to the bottom image. Um, and then we're going to show it again. And then we're going to do wait key zero this time because we're not using a video. And that's how we do a color range. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, so the, the image right, this image up here is what was fed into this function. Um, so this is a really good way. I mean, you don't need to have a live robot. Um, one of the nice things with the vision like this is you can take pictures and run them through or um, feed video files in, uh, for example. Um, and that's also even a really good way of during matches. If for some reason you think your calibration is off or you can't get to the field to calibrate your cameras, um, if you've got video that you've recorded, uh, from the robot during matches. Uh, you can rerun those through your algorithms and tweak them back in the pits uh, for deployment on the next time you're out for a match. And then this bottom frame is actually showing you where it's detecting this value. So it's, it's this green is not something we highlighted. This is the green LEDs that Ian talked about that are reflecting back. And this is the image it results out of that. You'll notice that little interference there at the bottom. We'll remove that in the next step. Actually, next, next step. All right, so this time we're drawing contours. Um, basically, we're doing the same thing. Um, all we've done is we've added this little uh, fine contours. So fine contours, uh, there's a bunch of different um, algorithms for how OpenCV finds contours. We just did the simplest one here, chain of proc simple. Um, the docs are pretty good at explaining what these do. Um, we're going to loop through the contours in the image. Uh, basically, contour is just another word for um, the the white thing you just saw. Um, it's it's basically a section of an image that it's going to highlight. Um, so every shape that was still in that image is going to be highlighted. We can see that the one down here in the bottom image, uh, the green distortion is also highlighted because it did see that as a contour. Um, the top one is also highlighted um, because, again, in the previous slide, you saw that those were both uh, selected right in the range. Yeah, so that, that draw contours, you can see now how there's some yellow that's around all of these. Um, one of the reasons we do that is that you can actually 
take this image and send it back to the driver station, for example, so the driver can physically see what you're detecting. Um, and it's also important we even like log it into our own because of the bandwidth issue, issues I mentioned before. Um, we have a way of recording this in, in our co-processor. Uh, so we can tell as it's driving around of areas that we need to fix if it's detecting things poorly. All right, so that little issue we saw down there. Oh, go, go. Oops. Yeah, go back one. All right. I think one more. One more? Yeah, because the other one, I, I we fixed something. Yeah, go back one more. Okay. Cursor. Can I take away? Yeah, all right. So now we're solving issues. Um, so this is kind of the third step of what of what we do. Generally, we draw contours after we did this, but whatever. Um, so this time, instead of solving issues by, say, taking the largest contour, we already noticed that this contour at the bottom that was highlighted is probably going to be bigger than the one up here. So we can't just do a simple size. Um, because of the size of the slides, I can't show you an actual algorithmic version of where we take like the angles of both sides. We'll show that at the end here. Um, but what I did do is I figured, hey, um, we're shooting. The likelihood that the camera the top of the frame, that the target is in the top of the frame is really high. The likelihood that the target is in the bottom of the frame, super low. You'd have to be basically on the other side of the field for that to be the case. Um, so yeah, so what we did was we just cut the image in half. Um, as you can see here, um, we're basically just taking the cropped frame and we're cutting in half. Um, and then we're, we're passing that frame to the contours find counters. If you ever have an issue like this, um, like some distortion, especially like this is caused by our camera plate at the time, it's an easy way to just fix it. And realistically, if you're noticing that it's always above a certain point, it, it works, right? Um, obviously, an algorithmic detection would be better. Um, but for sake of demonstration purposes, this works fine. This is where you can, you can see in this image here, you can see how bright this green is reflecting. So it has to do with where the LEDs were placed and where the camera was placed. And uh, like Ian said, you know, at this point, we really couldn't move where this was. And so this is something that you may have to be prepared for on your robot. Um, it, it does work, you know, you should work early with your mechanical team um, to, to try to make placement important. And uh, we did much better this year than we did like the previous year for placement, um, but as you start going through and doing vision with your team, um, you'll start to realize that, oh, this is a problem. We need to think about this. And the mechanical team will start asking too about it. It's like, oh yeah, remember when we had this problem and, and they'll try to move things around. So we have a few questions. So color LED, um, green is better because it reflects, Mr. Day has a really good explanation of this, um, but basically it's, it's brighter, it reflects, and there's no other green on the field. So you're never gonna see any other green except if it's reflected. Um, also, uh, cropping makes calculation faster, kind of. If you're doing the same frame over and over again, then yes, because you cropped it once and it's basically gonna make it faster. But if you're doing something small like this, I mean, the difference you're gonna notice is gonna be negligible because you're cropping it and then you're just using it like twice. And so you're also gonna have to do the math for cropping. It's not that big of an impact. I would say if you're doing it, the more thing you wanna focus on unless you're doing like a lot, like a fair bit of processing. I know we kind of cut our frame anyway. Um, in my opinion, the speed difference is gonna be not great, um, but it depends. This is where we actually ran into a problem. It was a little bit of a balance with our code since we're using a stereoscopic camera. Um, like Ian said, it's better to go with a smaller resolution to get a faster frame rate. Um, but going to that smaller resolution, the pixels become bigger. And so if you think about how this camera is probably doing distance calculations, it's looking at two images that are separated apart by um, roughly six inches, six, seven inches or so. And um, it has to look at those objects. And if you start looking at your target over here and these pixels start to become huge, um, it becomes difficult to calculate those differences. Uh, so it ends up being a tweaking of frame size, refresh rate, 
Um, and then even what you need too, are all, you know, it's like the robots traveling fast. Um, you're not going, you're going to want to process things a little bit faster. Um, so you have to sort of tune and find out what really works with your robot and what, what you're trying to do. All right. And so this is just a bit of math. This is, if you're trying to turn your robot to something, um, what we're only adding here is we're basically taking the center of the image. Uh, this is the geometric center. Uh, this is, there's something else you can do with moments in OpenCV um, to take the, like the mass center, but it, it, this works fine. Um, as you can see, the little green yellow dot down there, um, that's what we're drawing here. Um, and all we're really doing is we're saying, if there's one contour, which is a fair check you should make, because in this game especially, there should never be two contours in the same image. Um, unless you've you got like a weird position where you see the bottom one as well. Um, the You're also going to draw a bounding rectangle, right? And then you're going to basically say, I want to take the upper right and this other point, and we're going to do a split. And then that'll just be our new point. Um, we're going to cut in half, and that'll be our new point. So it, it's a little bit of math. Um, it, But really, all you're doing is you're taking the top left of one rectangle, the top right of it again, and cutting in half. And then you're saying, that and my current image y coordinate is our, our point. Um, so yeah, that's all we're doing. Um, and then we do wake you zero again because we're just processing still images. Yeah, and the, and then the main reason we put the point here in the image um, was A, we wanted to see what we thought was the center because uh, we found times where we were detecting things and it was not where we thought it would be. But this ultimately is the value that we're sending down to the robot uh, for targeting with. Um, so whether or not we, you know, you may want to actually aim up higher or something, but we thought it was best to go right in the middle of the object and we could make other adjustments as we needed to based on distance. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit with the LEDs. So the reason why green is important, if you actually take a look at all the LEDs and you look at their specifications of their intensity, um, for that same LED that like we, uh, that Ian had a picture of that we were using, the super bright LEDs, you look at the different colors they have and you look at the, the brightness. So buying the same uh, like three watt LED, um, the green has the highest brightness out of all of them. Um, I, I say primary, the reason is because is the field's all red and blue everywhere. And so you want green. The secondary is that it's gonna be brighter and it's gonna travel further. Um, so this will I mean, obviously just becomes problematic. Uh, we actually threw, we started with one LED on our robot this year, but we discovered when we got back out by the color wheel, um, it was getting dim enough that we we're starting to pick up other greens around us. So we added a second LED to increase the brightness because um, the distance light is what it's all inversely proportional to the difference of the distance. So you're going to get really dim really quick. All right, so we got a few helpful tips here. Uh, these are things that we ran into um, and that are good to know. Um, okay, so light, first of all, uh, the major thing you're gonna spend a lot of time on at events is calibration. Um, there's actually a dedicated calibration time, um, if you guys didn't know that, now you know, um, where teams can go in the field and calibrate to the field because first events are never the same lighting-wise. Um, so you're gonna wanna write some sort of tool um, that recalibrates your um, your uh, system. What we did was we actually sent values to Shuffleboard um, to change the H, S, and V lower range and upper range. And then we added sliders and sent the image up there and then drivers can tune without code and I don't have to be there. So bonus. Um, basically that allows us to do it a lot quicker um, and it makes it a lot easier. Uh, this is also one part of a two-part process. Now that we've got the coordinate, we have to align ourselves with the point. Um, this is on the robot side. Uh, we're not covering that in this presentation because this presentation will be way too long. Um, but basically, you're going to do anything the same way you do in autonomous if you're driving to a point this time. Um, the less math you do, the better. Um, so loops and repeated calculations are not good. Um, a lot of times you'll find that something is being done more than once, especially with initialization. Same rules applies in Java. Uh, try to not initialize something like seven times because Python will let you do it, um, but don't. 
you can also skip frames. Um, if you're going at, if your camera's running at 60 or 100 FPS, you probably don't need every frame. Heck, if you're going at 30 FPS, you probably don't need every frame. Um, so you can skip frames and it'll reduce processing lag to say, maybe get a frame, but then wait and not process it. And then say every four or five frames. And there, now you've got your 100 FPS camera, but you're also doing it quicker. And that it'll still be sent to the driver station if you're using it as like a secondary cam. Um, but that way you don't have to process as much. Uh, and then finally, for Raspberry Pis, uh, SD cards do corrupt. Uh, even in our Justin, we've had an SD card corruption so many times. Make a backup of your SD card. Do like a full file backup. Um, because once you get it working and it, if it breaks, it's really annoying. Um, also, don't cheap out in S SD cards. Um, some are nicer, some are terrible. For this one especially, you're going to be shutting off. You want to basically set it up so it's read-only or read-write. Um, I think first is a guide on how to do this. Um, they do this on their like uh, FRC vision image. Um, so you can look at that if you need help with it. Um, but basically, that will reduce the amount of corruption you're going to experience. And that's an actual issue when you're turning off your robot with live computer training. That's just a, a common Raspberry Pi thing is that they, if you don't do a, a, a good sequence shutdown and like a power failure, um, that is, it'll just die. Um, and that's, that's usually when things get corrupted. Um, and Ian mentioned the FRC vision. I mean, that is a, a pre-built canned uh, tool that allows you, I mean, I think it actually has Python on it. So you could use OpenCV and write your vision code using that, that tool. And it does have built-in things for setting the color values and things like that, the shuffleboard. So there's ways of tweaking it with that tool. Again, we did go down that Raspberry Pi route because of the, the Z camera. All right, so this might be our final, it's one of these final slides. Um, robot communication. So there's two steps in robot communication. If your robot needs to respond to vision data, you're gonna need to send your data to the robot, right? Now there's some latency. Your robot also needs to process the data, more latency. Now, when you get the frame in the first place, there's also more latency because you need to process the frame in the first place. So there's a lot of latency here and that can lead to reduction in accuracy, uh, slowness, delayed actions, things like that. Um, so a few options to handle this. You're gonna either wanna average the received data. Um, so say like over time, once you press the shoot button, because this might change or shift or something especially when you're firing high power shots, there's gonna be latency on the, even the turret shifting. Um, and if you, these are just some options I thought up on the fly because our team actually does something similar with the averaging and stuff like that. Um, or you could predict the change based on coordinates and find the slope of the line and do something like that. But it's essentially the same as an average. Um, overall, it comes down to your what needs time to receive and process and we can reduce the time, but we can't remove it. Um, so higher power hardware is going to reduce it, but again, there's still network latency on network tables and things like that. So I mean, this is basically just like tuning your drivetrain. You've got a PID loop that you have to tune for your drivetrain. The same thing ends up happening with vision. It's, it's a whole feedback loop that's going between your shooter that you're trying to aim or, or whether you're turning your robot in a certain direction uh, and then the vision data that's there. And um, that's one of the things that we had discovered that there was uh, going to the network table there was a, there was a lot of latency that was there um and if you think about the optimal efficiency of what your revision is you know your, your drivetrain if we're processing independently of these camera frames uh the drivetrain doesn't really need it potentially as fast as we're calculating it um it's going to be really important that your robot gets things at a, a consistent schedule that it wants it um so I think that's coming up in the slide later on, but one of the one of the ideas is let the let the robot actually pull the camera to say, hey, where are you right now? Tell us your, your current target that you want us to go to. Uh, we were pushing all the data in this last year or so out to the network table. Um, and, and that network cable is not the most efficient communication on an FRC robot. Ian, you're on mute. Just so you know. Sorry. Uh, we got a few questions. Uh, Chameleon Vision. I haven't personally worked with Chameleon Vision. I've been watching the project. I don't know if you have comments on this, Mr. Day. Um, I have not. I mean, I think it's basically like another version of the FRC Vision. It's a pre-built image that allows you to 
the due to the de detection. Um, it would probably work. It's like, I think the chameleon vision is the same type of thing, right? It's, it's you have to put your own open CV type of code in and do your same detection. All right. Uh, and then cameras, multiple cameras. Um, we actually have two different pies running. One's running FRC vision, I think, and the one's running uh, yep. the normal, um, I don't know what you call it, the, our robot detection code. Um, right. So that's an option. I haven't really worked with USB cameras, wet hubs, but I think that would be fine. I mean, it's USB cameras. I've seen teams at competitions. There was one robot that actually had, I think it was six cameras on the robot. And they were stitching it all together to get a 360 view of the robot at the driver's station. Um, and they did a lot of processing on that camera and try to minimize speed. So remember, when you start talking about multiple cameras, you're, you're probably thinking of for the driver's station, for navigation, for the driver to do things. And you do have that bandwidth limit that the fields have. Um, it's, it's, you're, you're not even guaranteed. It's like, what, I think seven megabits is what it was last year. Um, but you're not even guaranteed seven megabits at a competition. You, you, you actually have a guarantee of zero. Um, if we discover conditions at an event are so bad, we may force a lower bandwidth on all the robots. Um, and basically the only traffic that we get through would be the robot communication and, and vision's not part of that. Um, and that was one thing that we did. So we didn't talk about that in this, in this presentation, but we wanted to combine our vision detection with the driver camera uh, for two reasons. One, to limit the bandwidth. And the other one was to give him feedback of where our detection physically was. Um, and so that way he just had one thing to look at rather than multiple screens. Um, and, uh, the one thing I would recommend is that we ran into, uh, don't use cameras on the Robo Rio. The USB part, they've got the built-in camera vision that's there for it. Um, I mean, it's fine if you're starting off and you just want a driver camera. Uh, but one of the things that we found is it affects the, the Robo Rio loop time. Um, the paths and stuff we were running autonomous uh, would greatly exceed our 20 millisecond target that we had. Um, I mentioned earlier about wanting to have a very consistent signal coming through for, when you think about autonomous to follow a path, you basically want things to be very consistent as you go through. And uh, we've got a 20 millisecond loop time for our drivetrain that just says, okay, here's the speed, follow, go, 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 go. And um, if that thing veers, now all of a sudden you've got a bunch of changes in where your trajectory is and the robot doesn't quite run as smooth. Um, and so anything you can do to limit that's good. And yeah, I think we're almost at time, um, or we're at time pretty much. Uh, Mr. you wanna go to the next slide real quick? This is just a quick example. Um, I just wanna talk quick about what's going on in the future. Um, I saw this future vision is artificial intelligence, uh, in my opinion. Um, because it's more accurate when trained. It doesn't require special lighting conditions and it's just cool. Um, but it can, it can entirely ignore the vision tape. So something that's been happening, I've seen is a lot of teams kind of looking at that. Um, and we tried that out this year. That's just a quick video of it. We don't really need to show it because we are kind of out of time. I think it's like 30 seconds. Um, but with this, um, it's an option if once you guys get confident in this and are able to do this pretty well. Um, that's where I kind of see it moving in the future. So yeah, that's cool. Um, if we have any more questions, um, yeah. Yeah, this, this is the big, one of the big reasons why um, we went with the Z and everything. We wanted more horsepower. We want to go to this vision of using um, actual detection. We don't have to worry about LEDs. We don't have to worry about lighting conditions. We're just detecting stuff. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending.